guys, and welcome to the Moms and Mysteries podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I'm doing all right. How are you? I am doing okay. I am excited to share some news with everyone. Me too. I'm excited yeah. to share the same news, I think. I, <laughs> wouldn't it be great if we had two different things of news that we were sharing and neither of us knew what the other one was sharing, but we're like equally as excited? Yeah. Um, but this is actually a joint um not a joint statement. announcement? Yes. A joint announcement. It's a good one. Okay, let's get right into it. Mandy, we were contacted by Moment, and uh, they were formerly known as Moment House, if that sounds more familiar, just like we were formerly known as Moms and Murder. But anyway, Moment offers these, like, what they call a worldwide digital experience. What? What? <laughs> it's like a live show, but you can, like, not wear pants like you can just be at your house watch please wear pants but you can just be at your house <laughs> watching us do like a real legit live show um, and you're part of the audience but you don't have to go anywhere and uh, see other people which is like my favorite thing it's kind of like Saturday Night Live, but probably not as Mandy, good. <laughs> absolutely take it down a mil This is like local theater. That's what it is. It's local theater where only the understudies have shown up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited about doing the moment, though. Um, I We've been uh, had this in the works for a little while. We've been planning what we were going to do. And yeah, I, I'm really excited and just excited to see how it all turns out, of course, as we always are when we do anything like this so the idea with moment if you're not familiar with it is you'll there ha we have pre-sale tickets that are available until friday january 20th for seven dollars and fifty cents general admissions ten dollars day of show 1250 anyway it's an hour-long live show where you can interact with other listeners while we're doing the show so you're watching it and there's like a comment section we can see your comments so be nice and your questions and stuff so we'll be doing like an episode episode which people always say they want to see us do these episodes you might change your mind after this but that is an <laughs> option so um it's going to be available right now really and uh the live show itself again it's digital it's online we have like a professional camera crew and audio so it's like legit um but it's going to be february 12th at 8 p.m eastern standard time there will be so many things in the show notes this week, so you'll want to check that out. We'll have it in there. And if you haven't visited our website, momsandmysteries.com slash events is where this is going to be. So it's an easy click to get there. I have to make that page, but now I have pressure to make it by Tuesday. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it'll be there. It'll be very simple. It's it, Don't overthink this. I know it sounds weird that it's a live show, but it's online, but it's not Zoom. It's really a lot of fun. I went to one... Uh, last year for Watch What Crappens, and it was so much fun to interact with other listeners of the show and just like comment at as, as it was going on. So we think you guys will really enjoy it. And we don't have to go anywhere. That's my yeah, favorite thing. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, exactly. And then there will even be a little after party. So yes. for those of you who say you always feel like you are sitting around the table listening to us tell you a story, now you kind of can be. So that will be um, really fun. I'm looking forward to that too and getting to kind of interact with some of our listeners. So that's another little extra thing that's there that you can find out more about, as Melissa said, on the website. Um, we'll have all the information there. And check out the website anyway because it's brand new. And awesome. there's a lot to see there. So yeah, definitely go check out the new website. Yeah. We're super proud of the website that um, Rachel made for us. So yeah, yeah, check that out. She's great. Um, perfect. Mandy, without further ado, are you ready to get into this week's absolutely jaw-dropping episode? I am. I am. We talked a little bit um, last night about how this was probably like one of the wildest stories. I was trying to think of a synonym for wild and crazy and right. didn't really come up with many, but I haven't used the word bonkers in a while. So yeah, this is a bonkers story. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think the best way to get into this one is really just to jump right in. So we are just going to jump right in. Late on the night before Easter in 1960, the parents of Irene Garza were waiting for her return from the Easter vigil at Sacred Heart Church in McAllen, Texas, when they became concerned about their daughter's whereabouts. Irene was 25 years old and devout in her Catholic faith. Staying out late without notice really just wasn't something that she would do, but her family did know that she had gone to church that evening and, of course, assumed that she would be home any time. Irene's parents, Nicholas and Josephine, worked hard to give Irene and her sister Josie a better life than the one they had growing up, in a time when segregation was really prevalent in the neighborhoods and schools in Texas. 
According to CNN, even at the hospitals, Mexican-Americans and Anglos were segregated and treated with a lower level of care. Hispanics in Texas were only allowed to attend school until the fifth grade even at this time. And it was just really just kind of to highlight what a terrible time of inequality and discrimination this was. Yeah. So thankfully, Nicholas and Josephine were successful at their business, which was a dry cleaning store, and they used their earnings to provide more opportunities for Irene and Josie. Until high school, the girls attended Catholic school, where Irene thrived and became even more devout in her faith. She was described as being highly religious. Um, She went to confession every Saturday, whether she really needed to or not, and she attended church every Sunday. On this particular day, Irene had gone to church at around 7 p.m. for confession, but when she didn't return home by midnight, her parents started to worry. At about 2.30 in the morning, they decided to go and look for her themselves, but instead, they just found her car parked outside of the Sacred Heart Church, and Irene was nowhere to be found. Nicholas and Josephine sounded the alarm, and numerous family members, friends, and neighbors formed search parties and started looking for Irene. Police officers from the city, state, and the county also got involved in the search, with 70 members of the Hidalgo Sheriff's Office and 65 National Guardsmen being among those that were searching for the missing young woman, by land and by air. The local police chief vowed to spend as much money as necessary to investigate this disappearance. But as the story unfolded, a really shocking and horrific reality started to come to light. Irene Garza had always been a gentle-natured and caring young woman. After high school, she attended Pan American College, where she became the first in her family to earn a degree. She became an elementary school teacher and taught second grade at Thigpen Elementary. She was really gifted with this ability to be able to connect with children. The school she worked at was in a low-income area, and many of her students didn't even own a pair of shoes. And Irene would often spend her own money to buy them supplies and other things the children might need. Irene was also charitable and giving with her time in other areas of the community. She often spent her time in the nursing home, doing the residents' hair and nails, or helping with whatever they needed so they would look nice when their families came to visit on Sunday. Pretty much everyone loved Irene. As her cousin Linda said, she was just a sweet and simple person. She was always poised and elegant and an inspiration to little girls. And for as beautiful as Irene was on the inside... She had the outward looks to match. She was described as having a natural effervescence, her hair was beautiful and shiny, and she had a musical sounding voice and always smelled of flowers. In addition to being a gifted school teacher, Irene was also a beauty queen. In college, she was crowned prom queen and homecoming queen, and in 1958, she was crowned Miss South Texas. Her beauty never went to her head, though, because according to those who knew her, her heart was just too big, which is such a sweet way to think of someone that just like they could not even have an ego because they just had such an amazing heart. She lived in a nice neighborhood with her parents and sister, and although she wasn't married, the subject of becoming a wife and mother was something that had always been on her mind. At the time of her disappearance, Irene was seeing two different men, but because her car was found at the church, police didn't focus their investigation on them, but focused their investigation there at the church instead. Many witnesses said they saw Irene arriving to the church at about 7 p.m. on April 16, 1960. Irene was seen in the church kneeling and praying until about 8.15 p.m. Multiple priests at the church were there before, during, and after Irene arrived. At some point, Irene was seen walking to the church rectory, which is something that would be considered extremely strange as there was really no reason for Irene to go there. A rectory is the housing provided by a church organization for the priests or ministers to live in. There's no reason why a member of the church would go there because meeting in the rectory is completely inappropriate and forbidden. It's actually a violation of Catholic principle. Witnesses saw Irene walking to the rectory, but no one witnessed her leaving, and Irene wasn't seen again. Word of her disappearance spread quickly in the media, and before long, the search for Irene had generated national media attention. Irene's friends and family told the police about the last time they spoke to her and how everything seemed pretty normal. Earlier in the day that Saturday, Irene actually called her younger cousins and was telling them about how she had made Easter baskets for them. And they talked about the Easter egg hunt that they would be having the next day. It was their family tradition. So everything seemed normal. 
Also on Saturday, Irene called her friend Sylvia to ask if she wanted to go to confession with her, but Sylvia wasn't home, so Irene decided to go alone. After speaking to some of the witnesses from the church, the police learned that one of Irene's second grade students named Juan Gonzalez uh, and his mom were in the church that night. They said they didn't see Irene, but they did see a purse that had been left behind on a church pew, and they turned this into one of the priests that was there named Father John Fight before they left. Numerous witnesses said they actually saw Irene in the church that evening, but nobody could confirm seeing her after she walked to the rectory. Naturally, investigators did look around in the rectory, but they didn't find anything noteworthy in there or in the pastoral house. In the days following Irene's disappearance, the police received hundreds of leads to wade through, including a report of a patron at the Highway Grill in Edinburgh, Texas, who told a waitress that he had murdered Irene, and he said that this waitress was next. Whoa. Yeah, which is such a weird, like, crazy and terrifying. But when the police actually tracked him down, he said that he had been joking and he was drinking when he said that, and so he was just joking around, I guess, trying to get a rise out of this waitress, which... Such I'm sure a it weird did. Thing to do. So another lead that the police followed involved a woman calling them and claiming that her name was Irene and said that she had been kidnapped and was being held hostage in a motel room in Hidalgo, Texas. But after officers raced to the motel, they quickly learned that this was just a hoax. Two days after Irene was last seen, friends of hers, including a man named Alfredo, were searching these back roads for any signs of her when they actually found her purse about 20 to 30 yards off the road, and it was in a field covered in mud. Alfredo picked up the purse and took it to Irene's family to see if they could identify it, you know, as definitely belonging to Irene, and her family said that it was her purse. On that same day, Irene's lace veil and one of her shoes was found off the same road, which led to police developing this early theory that whoever was responsible for her disappearance had thrown her belongings from the window of a moving vehicle. After five days of searching for Irene, investigators got a tragic break in the case when Irene's body was found on April 21st. She was found face down in the 2nd Street Irrigation Canal in McAllen, Texas, which is about three miles from the Sacred Heart Church where she was last seen. Irene was still partially dressed with her blouse unbuttoned and her underwear and shoes missing. Irene had been raped and her cause of death was trauma to the right side of her head, hemorrhage of the brain, and suffocation. Unfortunately, any evidence that would have been on her body was washed away in the canal. Four blocks away, investigators found what they believed was a spot where Irene initially was placed in the canal. They found tire tracks, a muddy shoe print, and the faint imprint of Irene's petticoat on the ground. They also found one of Irene's hairs there. Police figured someone had unloaded Irene's body from a car and dumped her into the water. As soon as the word of Irene's murder broke, rumors began to spread and residents of the area were hysterical with panic. One report said, quote, Rumors as to the identity of the murderer went beyond the ridiculous, and it appeared that everyone was prepared to believe anything, end quote. The whole town was really shaken. Nothing like this had ever happened there before, and people just didn't know what to think or to do. Police worked tirelessly to provide answers to the community, interviewing over 500 people in the first few weeks after Irene's body was found. Friends, family, ex-boyfriends, co-workers, and even local sex offenders were all given polygraphs. Everyone that was in the church on the same evening Irene was last seen were interviewed at length. They even reconstructed the confession lines from the evening, mapping out who stood in front of who and behind who, which is interesting to think of like this whole like reenactment basically that they're making up. But one name that kept popping up in this investigation was kind of a surprising one. And that was the name of Father John Fight. So keep in mind, at the time this took place, nobody was ever going to mistrust a priest. They were held to a different standard, and it was unheard of at that time for a priest to be suspected in a crime, but definitely not a murder. But when police drained the canal where they believed Irene was dumped and found a photo slider viewer two weeks later, signs did seem to point to the impossible that Father John Fight did have something to do with this heinous crime. 
So just a note here for those who were born way after the photo slide viewer was a thing. I actually had to look this up, but it was a kind of a neat little thing that was used a lot in the 1950s and 60s that was used to view film slides. So Kodak, of course, first introduced the film slide in 1935 and slide projectors and viewers really started gaining popularity in the 50s. That This was when like slideshows were a thing and like took off. So what they found in the canal was this handheld photo slide viewer, you know, that was used for just like viewing photographs or whatever that you took. Right. Um, it was like one of the only, it's not like they have today, everything's a digital image. You know, they had to actually use like a little device to magnify the, you know, photo slide. So they that was what they found. So that was what they found. And they asked the public for help to identify the owner of this photo slide viewer. And a few days later, Father John Fite from Sacred Heart Church wrote a note to the police saying that he was the owner of the photo viewer, but he didn't offer up any explanation as to why it was in the canal. They also found in the canal a candelabra that was determined to have come from Sacred Heart Church. Nothing was really done with this piece of potential evidence, even though it very well could have been the murder weapon. But officers did begin to look into the possibility that Father John knew more about Irene's death than he was leading on. Not only was it strange and surprising that the slide viewer belonged to Father John, but he was also coincidentally the last person who was confirmed to have seen Irene alive. Investigators thought that even if he wasn't involved in her murder, there was still a really good chance that he might have some helpful information. They, of course, have already spoken to the church members who were there on April 16th and confirmed that Father John was seen in and around the church campus all throughout that evening. Father John even told other priests that Irene had asked him about going to confession in the rectory, and he said that he told her that she needed to confess in the church. However, when the police asked him about that evening, he said he actually did not see Irene for confession that night. But... Again, that's not what Irene's friend Anna said when she spoke to investigators. She said it was actually sometime during Holy Week that Irene mentioned this new priest at church who was Father John. Irene told Anna that she thought Father John was handsome. And she also said that Father John had once before told her that she was too good to confess in the confessional and that he would take her out of the confessional and into the rectory to give her confession. Anna did say that Irene was really confused by Father John's insistence that she confess in the rectory because, as we said before, this wasn't a common thing to do. It was actually kind of taboo, and Irene was very devout in her faith. So when she would tell her friend about this, she would be like, I'm not really sure, you know, why he wants me to do this. But, of course, as we said, she's very trusting of the church and of this priest. So she's like, okay, I'll, you know, I'll go to the rectory. And Father John started looking even more suspicious when police learned about another attack that he may have been involved in. A few weeks before Irene's murder, on March 23, 1960, another young woman named America Guerra was at the Sacred Heart Church in Edinburgh, Texas to pray when she was attacked from behind. 20-year-old America arrived at the church to find that it was empty. She went to the communion rail and knelt down, but then a man came up behind her and tried to stuff a rag into her mouth and threw her to the ground. America bit the man's finger in the struggle, causing him to bleed, and she was able to run away to safety. America reported the attack to police that evening and said that the man who tried to put the rag in her mouth had dark hair and horn-rimmed glasses, and he was wearing black pants. She said she thought the man was a priest. After this attack, the church suspected Father John of being responsible, but instead of turning him into the police, they sent him 12 miles away to the Sacred Heart Church in McAllen so that they could keep an eye on him or, you know, protect him. After Irene's body was found and police learned about the attack on America, they asked her to look at a lineup to try and identify the man who attacked her at the church. America very quickly picked Father John out of the lineup. As they dug more into similar claims, they found out that there was another woman named Beatrice Garcia who also had a strange encounter with John in April of 1960. 20-year-old Beatrice was walking near Sacred Heart Church in McAllen when John drove up beside her in his car and said that he would love to take a picture of her, quote, dressed in black by the cemetery, end quote. Police noted that Beatrice, America, and Irene all looked pretty similar, which only added to the suspicion that Father John was targeting them. So what exactly was John's background, and where did he come from originally? John Fight was born on November 24, 1932 in Illinois, and he grew up in Chicago. 
His uncle, who was also named John, was a priest in Detroit, and when John was 13, his parents sent him to a seminary in San Antonio, Texas, where he studied for the Missionary Oblates of Mary Immaculate, and he was ordained on September 8, 1958. At the time of Irene's murder, John was attending a year-long pastoral training at the Missionary Oblates in San Juan, Texas, and up until the attack on America Guerra, he was helping out at the Sacred Heart in Edinburgh, which was about 11 miles from where he stayed in San Juan. John was described as being a bit of a loner and aloof, but he was well-mannered, polite, and seemed bright. And we're going to get more into this story after a quick break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. So before the break, we were talking about how 26-year-old Irene Garza was last seen alive when she went to Sacred Heart Catholic Church for confession on the night before Easter in 1960. Her body was found face down in a nearby canal several days later, and it was clear that she had been sexually assaulted before she was killed. Early investigation into her death showed that Father John Fite was the last person confirmed to have seen Irene alive. But at the time, nobody would ever suspect a priest of being capable of murdering a young woman. However, it was learned that Father John actually had a history of disturbing behavior with women, even though some people said that he was polite, well-mannered, and bright. There was enough suspicion around John that the police wanted to give him polygraphs to determine whether or not he may have been involved in multiple crimes. Over the course of two days, John evaded questions related to the murder of Irene Garza and the attack on America Guerra. They asked John what Irene had confessed to him about on April the 16th, and he said that Irene's confession had upset him so much that he began sweating profusely and needed to drive around to calm himself down. He also claimed that the person who murdered Irene had confessed to him as well. The person administering these polygraph tests later said that John was responding in a way that made it seem like he was concealing information or just otherwise not telling the full story. And it really wasn't just the police that thought, you know, had that same sentiment and thought John was suspicious. There was other priests from Sacred Heart Church who thought the same thing. Father Joseph O'Brien had multiple reasons to be suspicious, including that he had noticed these scratches on Father John's hands and on the tops of his arms on the night that Irene disappeared. He also knew that John had used the parish car multiple times that day. Father O'Brien even tried to follow John on Easter night, but lost him in traffic, which I do think is interesting because clearly Father O'Brien is thinking that at the very least, something suspicious or sketchy is going on. At this point, they don't even know that anyone has been hurt, but Father John is acting in a way that doesn't doesn't really make a lot of sense to this other priest. And so it's to the point where, you know, he wants to actually follow him. So that's kind of interesting right there in itself. Right. Like, how many people have you followed in your entire life? So for somebody to like, yeah, exactly, to do this, it's a big deal. For sure. So Father O'Brien later also looked around in the basement and in the attic of the rectory, which again just goes to, speaks to how, you know, concerned that he was that something was amiss, but he didn't find anything there. Officers inspected the parish car and they saw that it actually had been cleaned inside and out, but a test confirmed that blood had once been on the seat of the car. At this point, the McAllen chief of police believed that John was guilty, But still, the lead investigator on the case didn't believe that a priest even could be guilty of murder. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So by the time the investigators actually caught up with John to speak to him again, he had changed his story. Now he said that Irene had called on April the 16th, and it was at about 7 p.m. He said that he and Father O'Brien were leaving the rectory at the time when Irene called. And when she called, she asked to actually speak to another priest named Father Junius. But he was hearing confession in the church. So John told Irene that if she came over right away, he could speak with her. He said that Irene arrived and discussed a personal problem with him in the rectory, and this was done so that she wouldn't be overheard by anyone else in the church. And then after they were done talking about this personal, private matter, John said that he sent her to the church to go to confession. He said they left the rectory together, and they both went to the church at the same time. She went to go to confession, and he also went to go hear confessions in the church from others. So members who were in the church that night said that Father John's line for confession actually stopped moving at about 8 p.m. and it didn't even seem like there was anyone in the confessional after that. Through speaking to the other priests at the church, investigators learned that Father John was seen again at about 9.50 that night. 
He told Father Birch that he needed to go to San Juan to get his spare pair of glasses because a screw had fallen out of his. And after that, he then went back to McAllen and said the Easter Vigil Mass along with the other priests at the church. On Easter morning the next day, John offered two morning masses and a late afternoon mass as well as performed baptisms all afternoon. That evening, Irene's parents went to the church to speak with Father John because by this point they had heard that Irene confessed to Father John the night before and that he was potentially the last person to speak to her. So they wanted to know if John may have said something that would have upset Irene during her confession or just kind of get a feel for, you know, what was her state of mind whenever he spoke with her. And he said, no, there was nothing, you know, upsetting that was said and pretty much just said he had no idea where she was or what happened after that. Which is interesting since he tells police it was so upsetting whatever she told him he had to literally drive around. Investigators asked John about the attack on America Guerra that took place on March 23rd. They knew he was suspected of being her attacker, but they wanted to hear his story. He said that he had been in the church praying until 5.15 that evening, at which point he left to meet with a church member to discuss a private matter. But he said he was back in San Juan by 5.30 to ring the bell. During this conversation, officers saw a bite mark on John's finger, and when they asked him about it, he said it came from the mimeograph machine. He had hurt himself on March 22nd with this mimeograph machine, which is basically an old school copy machine. If I'm saying it wrong, just pretend I didn't because we've described it well enough. You should know what I'm talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Witnesses in San Juan said they did not hear the bell ring that day at 530. They also said that John injured his finger on March 23rd, not the 22nd. And the church member that met with John that afternoon said he was wearing horn rim glasses and had on a tan shirt and black pants, which matched the description America gave of her attacker. Eventually, investigators were able to gather enough evidence against Father John for the attack on America. And on August 5th, 1960, he was charged with assault with intent to rape. When they went to find John to arrest him, though, guess what? He was nowhere to be found. A week later, though, John turned himself in and said he was not a fugitive and he had nothing to hide. He said he'd been in a hospital out of the state, which he had checked himself into because his legal issues had affected his nervous system and he needed to get some rest and a peace of mind. Isn't that literally the definition of a nervous breakdown? Yeah. (laughs) If your nervous system's been affected. So at this point, John's actually spent about two weeks in a medical center run by the church called the Alexian Brothers Hospital and Dispensary. An expert named Thomas Doyle said, quote, In that era, from the 60s and even before that, into the 70s and 80s, when bishops had bad actors among the priests, including sexual abuse, they would send priests to specialized healthcare facilities, in this case, Alexian Brothers. They took in priests and promised anonymity, end quote. So after John bailed out of jail in case of the attack on America, he returned to Alexian Brothers facility. But John's troubles were far from over. After he was officially charged with attacking America, the rumors flew about his involvement in Irene's murder. Media outlets outlined the parallels between these two cases. The trial for America's case had to be moved to another county because of the media coverage Father John was getting, which only made rumors increase even further. Finally, in September of 1961, John went to trial for the attack on America, but unfortunately, the case ended up with a hung jury with 9-3 to three in favor of conviction. John was sent to the New Melloray Abbey in Iowa, and this is a monastery for Trappist monks, which might sound kind of weird, but yeah. according to that expert that we mentioned before, Thomas Doyle, this was actually a great place for Father John to hide. In a place like a monastery, John would be isolated from the outside world, and it was common for priests to be sent to these maximum security monasteries really as a punishment. But it's unlikely that anybody at the monastery even knew anything about John's past because at this time, there really just was no record kept of wrongdoings, you know, or troubles that priests had. John was set to be retried for America Guerra's assault, but in March of 1962, he ended up pleading no contest to a misdemeanor count of aggravated assault and agreed to a fine of $500 plus court costs in this deal that actually got the DA off of his back. 
So the Hidalgo County DA named Robert Lattimore said that he would actually stop investigating John and there would be no charges brought against him for Irene's murder if he took this deal and pleaded no contest to this misdemeanor count of aggravated assault. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So this deal wasn't even put in writing, but the judge who sentenced Father John for the no contest plea agreed to follow the plea bargain that the DA had set up. The Catholic Church was happy with this deal, and they agreed to move Father John out of the area and into a monastery. So John went back to Iowa, and Irene's murder case went cold. At some point in the summer of 1962, John wrote a letter that read, in part, quote, The time has come to make some definite decisions, enabling me to begin a regular and ordered life with definite goals and a definite aim in life. My gosh. Okay. Yeah, the time has come. (laughs) Yeah, this is so infuriating that like it's kind of like, oh, we don't want to deal with him. He's not our problem. And we send him somewhere else and hope he's not going to be a problem there. Like he's literally been a problem everywhere. Everywhere. And people are just like, but he's not our problem. That seems to be what it is. It's not our problem. It's your problem It is just like passing the buck kind of. Oh my gosh. It's like in the most extreme way. Yeah. And of course, and you know, we see stories of, you know, that have happened throughout the Catholic Church and other churches too. So I don't want to just look at that one where people have been protected. And now it's kind of like seeing this history. It's like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, they, they were, they went beyond just protecting people and hid people so they wouldn't get in trouble. It's, it's truly wild. So by early 1963, John had been sent to another Trappist monastery near Ava, Missouri called Lady of Assumption Abbey. There, John lied as a pestilent and was pursuing a monastic life. He was counseled and guided by the priest and the monk there, a man named Dale Tackney. It was actually up to Dale to determine whether or not John was called to the monastic life. After six months, Dale and his superior determined that it was safe for Father John to return to the regular world. Upon his re-entry into society, John moved to Loyola College, a Jesuit school in John's hometown of Chicago. And this was a typical move for a priest who had a troubled background. There was a former priest there that said, quote, you can't put him back in a parish, so they stuck him in a school, end quote. John only attended the school for one semester, leaving after the assassination of John F. Kennedy because the Catholic president's death was upsetting to John. And so he never got his degree from Loyola College. By the end of 1964, John moved to a facility run by a Roman Catholic's religious order in New Mexico. This was a monastery school for troubled priests, and it was essentially the church's last resort for the most troubled priests, besides, of course, you know, prison. Um, It was the last stop for those who wanted to stay in the church. So John ends up staying there for seven years and eventually joined the servants of the paraclet. He became a quote-unquote superior there and had the responsibility of supervising more than 80 other priests. Oh my gosh. Like, why are we giving him power within this on top of that? It's that just, makes no sense. No, it's infuriating. And so one of the priests that John supervised was James Porter, who was known as one of the, quote, most dangerous and depraved sexually offensive priests ever, end quote, which is a quote from one of his victims. So James Porter was a massive threat, but Father John continued to release him on temporary assignments at churches in New Mexico and Texas and even one location in Minnesota. Oh my gosh, which is, that is, wow. How is he in charge of releasing people and he knows, the bad guy knows the bad guy is bad and is still doing this. It, it, uh, oh, this story. So James Porter continued his abuse of children for over 20 years, later pleading guilty to molesting 28 children, although he told a reporter there were over 100 victims, some of whom were abused by Porter as many as 100 times. Monster. Sickening. Absolutely sickening. So in 1971, John requested what is basically a release from his obligation as a Catholic priest. So in other words, he didn't want to be part of the church, didn't want to be a priest. He just wants to be a normal person now, which... It's very nice that he just has the option to just be like, all of these thanks options. for helping me through all this, you know, problem. Now I don't want anything to do with you guys. Crazy. So after that, he got out of the church and he married a woman from New Mexico and they went on to have three kids together. John started working in insurance sales, but he held multiple other jobs and the family moved several times before they ended up in Phoenix in 1979. 
John's older brother lived and worked there as a priest as well, so that maybe is why they decided to go there. Uh, But John actually also started working at a Catholic food bank in Scottsdale, Arizona, and he held that job for many, many years. The director of the food bank said that John was, quote, extraordinarily kind, caring, compassionate. He was viewed as someone who had a genuine love and this great love for the less fortunate and the poor in the community. So meanwhile, with John out of sight and out of mind for decades, the investigation into Irene's murder completely faded away and nobody was ever arrested in connection with her death. The media did continue to suspect John's involvement, and Irene's family did continue to investigate on their own, and they continue to pressure law enforcement to keep investigating this case. But as we said, the years have gone by, and you know, this happens with any case that kind of goes cold. It's like, yeah, it's very frustrating for the family because the farther you get away from it, it's like you do kind of feel like, are we ever going to get answers? Is this ever going to be solved? Yeah. Irene's family had actually long suspected that the church was even conspiring with the police. Before Father John had ever taken that plea deal that got him off the hook for Irene's murder, a member of her family that worked for the Hidalgo County Sheriff's Office said he was told that his superiors would be taking over the investigation into the murder. At around the same time, Father O'Brien from Sacred Heart Church that we've mentioned before told Irene's parents that even if Irene was killed by Father John, the church would, quote, take care of him and they would find justice within the church. And this is interesting because Father O'Brien is the one who was also suspicious of Father John. Yeah. He's the one who followed him and, you know, but it's like, why is everybody still kind of protecting, you know, this man? Father O'Brien thinks he's guilty of something or has reason to believe that he is, but is still, you know, is telling Irene's family, like, if he is guilty of this, like, the church is just going to deal with it in their own way, you know, kind of like, give it up, like, don't even bother. Oh you know, gosh. It's just terrible, terrible. So a letter that they found later that was written in 1960 did seem to confirm these suspicions also. So this letter, the contents of this letter are kind of hard to follow. So we're going to do our best to condense it and hopefully make it make sense. So this letter was found when prosecutors later subpoenaed records from John's former religious order, the Missionary Oblates of Mary Immaculate, or OMI, before John's trial in the case of America Guerra. Father Paul Lickey from St. Helen's Missions in Georgetown, Texas, wrote to the head of the Southern Region of OMI, stating that he spoke with Sheriff Vickers regarding Father John and the murder of Irene, and that the sheriff felt that the case against Father John was weak. According to Father Paul Lickey, Sheriff Vickers said the church should not hire an attorney and that there shouldn't be police detectives on the case, since that would mean they were, quote, re-questioning witnesses and stirring things up again, end quote, which is such a messed up thing to say. The sheriff allegedly suggested that they should hire a PI who would write a summary that highlighted the loopholes in the case. Then the church should arrange a meeting with the McAllen police chief, the prosecutor, and of course, Sheriff Vickers himself, where they would show how strongly they opposed the charges against Father John. Sheriff Vickers said that this would basically quiet things down considerably. Sheriff Vickers says that after this meeting, they should have Father John transferred to another part of the country, and since priests are always being sent all over the place, this wouldn't be strange. This would get Father John out of the immediate area of suspicion. I'm so glad we're all protecting him. It's terrible. It should be noted that Sheriff Vickers was also Catholic, which is why the Catholic Church superiors were willing to listen to his advice. And considering all the places John was sent after he took the plea deal, it's probably all true that there was some type of a conspiracy to protect John. But in April of 2002, a guilty conscience may have been what led former monk Dale Tackney to come forward with new information. And we're going to get into what that information was after one last break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. So before the break, we have really shared a ton of information about the murder of Irene Garza and the potential involvement and likely involvement of a priest named Father John Fight. Um, now it has been several years. Irene's murder has case has gone cold. Father John has gone off. He's no longer a priest. He's living a completely different life. And now we're up to 2002. So it, as I said, has been many, many years, decades since this right. murder has taken place. And a former monk named Dale Tackney is coming forward to police with new information. 
as we said before, Dale had met John at one of the monasteries he attended in the years after Irene's murder. So in 2002, Dale Tackney wrote a letter to a retired San Antonio cold case investigator named George Sedler. And he explained how he had met John at the monastery way back in 1963. And at the time, he was in charge of determining whether or not John was fit for monastic life. Dale said in the letter that he had been told by superiors that John needed counseling because he had killed a woman and they were trying to figure out if he would fit in and could become a monk, which to me sounds like an immediate no, right? Like murder would right immediately off the disqualify bat. you from becoming a monk. So yeah, rule number one of monk club, yeah. there is no monk club, but rule number two should be if you murdered a woman, you go to prison. Right. So over the course of several months, John allegedly did admit to murdering a woman who was in her 20s. And when Dale asked John how he escaped going to prison and how he was even in the monastery, John said that the church had protected him. John told Dale that on the night of the murder, he heard the woman's confession and then later took her to the pastoral house. John told Dale that on the following day, which would have been Easter Sunday, he put the woman in the bathtub and left her there. And as he left, he heard the woman saying that she couldn't breathe. When John returned, the woman was dead, so he said he dumped her body on the side of the road next to a canal. In this letter, Dale Tackney said that he inferred from John's confessions that he must have bound and gagged the woman in order to get her into the rectory basement. And he also assumed that the woman had a plastic bag over her head when John left her in the bathtub. But John never named the victim and never talked about the location of the murder. So we aren't really even sure if it's the same, you know, same situation. So Dale thought that the murder happened between 1961 and 1963 in San Antonio and that the cause of death would have been suffocation. This is, of course, way off base for Irene's murder. But Dale also could have thought these things that, you know, that the murder was in San Antonio because that's where John had gone to school. And he could have assumed the dates incorrectly because that's when John got, you know, John got to the monastery in 1963. So it's possible that he's just piecing together different information and he kind of has like his facts wrong a little bit. Yeah. So Dale said in the letter that John claimed that he was triggered by the sound of high heels clicking on the ground when a woman walked and said that it made him want to attack the women from behind. And John also confessed that he felt this compulsion to attack women from behind when he was kneeling behind them in the church. Dale said that John had to undergo, I guess, this like test they set up for him where they would have him kneel behind women and then you know, tell them whether or not he had any urges to attack them. Oh gosh. Yeah. And so when he said, like, no, he didn't want to attack them, then they deemed him safe to go out into the public and to leave the monastery and go out and interact with people in the real world. It's almost like he could have lied and no right. one would have known. It's not a very scientific test, for sure. No. <laughs> um so Dale says that he never told anybody about any of this before because he felt that it was just his simply his job to counsel John and to keep his secrets. But now, years later, he was carrying so much guilt that he felt he finally had to come forward just to clear his own conscience, which good for him. But like, ugh, I don't know. I know. This story. Yeah. Dale's letter led to the reopening of Irene's murder case over 40 years later. Texas Ranger Rudy Jeremio had been working on the case but kept hitting dead ends until McAllen Police Chief Victor Rodriguez asked the cold case unit of the Texas Rangers to help. In November of 2002, Rudy met with Dale Tackney, and by the end of the conversation, he was convinced that Dale was talking about Irene's murder. Wanting to dig deeper, Ranger Jeremio talked with Father O'Brien and learned that he too had heard Father John's shocking confession. The story Father O'Brien got was very similar to Dale Techney. O'Brien said that he had gone to see John in the summer of 1960, and at the time, he pressured John to admit what happened. And that's when John admitted to the murder. Father O'Brien said he didn't want to embarrass the Oblates or be sued for slander, so he didn't go to the police. In light of all this new information, investigators pleaded with the DA to present these findings and other evidence to a grand jury, but DA Rene Guerra refused to pursue the case. Who knows what this guy's problem was, but he got nasty with Irene's cousin Linda when she tried to persuade him to prosecute Father John. He pointed his finger in Linda's face and said, quote, you will never get an indictment. You'll get one when pigs fly, end quote. This is the DA, the freaking DA is saying this to a family member just wild. 
And so the DA apparently didn't believe that John had ever admitted anything to Dale Tackney, and he didn't think Father O'Brien's story could be trusted either because he had dementia. In a July 2002 Brownsville Herald article, Guerra said, quote, I reviewed the file some years back. There was nothing there. Can it be solved? Well, I guess if you believe that pigs can fly, anything is possible. Why would anyone be haunted by her death? She died. Her killer got away, end quote. Wow. That is like so callous and so like cold hearted. It almost just blows my mind to think of a DA like saying something like that. I mean, literally jaw dropping to me to hear him say, why would anyone be haunted by her death? Like that's her family. Of course they are. It, it's It's been decades to just – callous is exactly the right word. And evil, to be quite honest. Evil, yeah. So Guerra did finally agree to present the findings to a grand jury in 2004, but the grand jury ended up finding that there just wasn't enough evidence to indict John. They didn't get to hear live testimony from Dale Tackney or Father O'Brien, though. They only got to hear recorded audio and review some transcriptions. And time continued to march on. Ten years later, in 2014, CBS aired a 48 Hours episode about Irene's case, and they named John as the killer in this documentary. So in this 48 Hours um, episode, correspondent Richard Schlesinger tracked John down and asked him if he had killed Irene all those years ago. Of course, John said no and said he didn't know who did. Richard confronted him by saying, quote, well, Dale Tackney says that you told him that you did kill her. And John responded with, quote, Dale is full of beep. Get lost, brother. And he slammed the door in his face. In November of 2014, D.A. Guerra was unseated when he lost the election to Ricardo Rodriguez, who actually had ran on the fact that he would reopen Irene's case if he was elected. They had all kinds of campaign materials, lots of justice for Irene um, stuff that they were pushing. And that was really like the main thing that he ran on, said that if he won, if he became the D.A., he was going to reopen this case, which, as we said, was such a widely publicized case. And so a lot of people in the area were like very on board for that. As part of that campaign, he also highlighted just how callous, you know, as we said, D.A. uh, Guerra had been towards the family and just made him, you know, look terrible as he should because he was terrible. But once he was in office, the new D.A. Rodriguez made good on his word and he did oversee the arrest and indictment of Father John once and for all. On February 9th, 2016, 83-year-old John was arrested at his retirement community in Scottsdale, Arizona. He said, quote, I've been questioned extensively about this dating back to 1960, so I'm disappointed, but not surprised, end quote. What? I, I would be so surprised if I got arrested. Just, yeah, it would be a surprise. Too. <laughs> and disappointing. So the media immediately exploded with the news of John's arrest. Irene's death was described in a court memo as being one of the most notorious and heavily publicized crimes in the history of the Rio Grande Valley. Reporters wrote things such as that it took so long to arrest John because of a cover-up orchestrated by the Catholic Church. 69% of potential jurors polled said they thought John was guilty of killing Irene and or guilty of conspiring with the church to cover up his guilt. The jury for John's trial was selected on November 28, 2017. None of John's family attended the trial, and his wife would not comment on the story when media reached out to her. So much time had passed that much of the evidence was in the form of hearsay, and there was very little physical evidence, but they did have a lot of witness testimony. Multiple witnesses testified about how much of a creep John was towards women. The prosecution theorized that John attacked Irene when she arrived in the rectory at about 7 p.m., and the McAllen police chief agreed that Irene was likely assaulted in the rectory at that time. He believed John bound, gagged, and eventually killed Irene. The stories of Dale Tackney and Father O'Brien were used to provide detail on how Irene was killed and dumped in the canal. Prosecutors pointed out that police were initially suspicious of John because he was the last person to see Irene alive. Plus, he admitted the photo slide viewer found in the canal was his, and his statements about what he was doing and how his hands were injured on April 16th were inconsistent. They also accused the Catholic Church of covering up the murder by making a deal with the DA, and they used that letter from Father Paul Lickey as evidence of this conspiracy. The prosecution said, quote, Irene was murdered. John Fight was moved out, and sure enough, he was. But as a part of that, John Fight also pled guilty or pled nolo contendere and was found guilty of aggravated assault of America Guerra. 
America Guerra was the lucky one. She was terrorized. He put a cloth over her mouth, threw her to the floor. He pled guilty or he pled no lo contendre, no contest, and was found guilty of that aggravated assault on her, but he didn't stop there. The wolf in priest's clothing went on, end quote. Then they went on to detail all the stories of the other women who had been attacked or made uncomfortable by Father John and then asked the jury to consider whether or not this behavior was what they would expect from a priest. The defense said that all the evidence prosecutors had was just hearsay and nothing positively linked John to the crime. There was no evidence of any of this happening in the rectory or the pastoral house and trace evidence from the parish car wasn't ultimately linked to John or Irene. The photo slide viewer wasn't on the list of evidence that was sent for testing because at the time they found it, it wasn't even considered a piece of evidence. And the only documentation of the slide viewer's existence was in an old newspaper article that was tucked into the police file. The defense said that Dale Tackney and Father O'Brien gave false stories and that Ranger Jeremio coached them and gave them facts so that he just could close the case. They also challenged the timeline that was presented by the prosecution, claiming that Irene couldn't have been attacked at 7 p.m. because there were witnesses at the church who said that they saw her as late as 8.15 p.m. And they also said that nobody reported anything suspicious, and there really were a lot of people in the church that night for the Easter vigil, so I guess they're saying, why wouldn't somebody have said something if they saw something or something was going on? So prosecutors even offered up another possible suspect. Father Junius. He was also hearing confessions that night, and he did know Irene. They said that he seemed nervous when the police initially interviewed him as well, but he wasn't ever considered a suspect. And he died in 2007, so of course he would be a great scapegoat for the defense at this point. And as for why John wasn't indicted in the murder before, the defense said that it was due to a lack of evidence, not due to any conspiracies with the church. They also brought up the plea agreement from 1962 and tried to say that this trial shouldn't have ever happened in the first place because he'd taken that deal where they said they wouldn't, you know, prosecute him for Irene's murder. Yeah. So John was asked whether he wanted to testify and he said, quote, there are several things I'd like to speak to. I'm kind of in between a rock and a hard place, end quote. He talked with his attorneys and decided not to testify. He said it was a battle between his vanity and common sense and common sense prevailed. The jury deliberated for six and a half hours, and on December 8th, 2017, John was finally found guilty of Irene's murder, 57 years later. Is he saying that common sense prevailed because he knew that he couldn't get up there and, like, make himself sound good? I think so. How is he going to be able to tell the truth? How is he going to make anyone believe anything he has to say? Yeah. But well, I mean, ego... at least he has, like, some self-awareness, but, like, that's crazy that he said like common sense prevailed that's basically just admitting that you did something yeah and that you're an idiot right Uh, which he is and he was sentenced to life in prison the next day in december of 2019 john filed an appeal listing 11 grounds of error one was that when john took that plea deal for attacking america guerra he was promised he wouldn't be charged for irene's murder the other grounds were all about allowing certain evidence or witness testimony into the trial but John passed away before the appellate court could respond. He was found unresponsive in his cell on February 11th, 2020, at the age of 87. He was taken to a hospital where he was pronounced dead after suffering cardiac arrest. What a story. I have no words. I don't have any words. It is truly... uh, (laughs) I don't think... I mean, yeah. Yeah. Let's go with that. I have no words. <laughs> I have a lot of stuttering and noises I'm making, but just unreal. Unreal. It really is. And like we talked before we recorded about how when you think about the time period that this happened, like it wasn't that long ago. I mean, it seems like the 1960s were so long ago, but it's like, oh my gosh, like all this like church cover up stuff and like you said, having him sent away to these different places and nobody wants to just tell the police the truth about what they know or suspect. Like, it's just wild to think that that was happening in the 1960s. It doesn't seem I like mean, it was that far away. Even even more recently, of course, but it's eye-opening to see this has kind of been going on forever, you know, that this is not something that's really been new but it is right. just a wild thing to be like oh yeah he killed somebody but like let's just send him to another state and if he doesn't get the urge to kill women when he's sitting behind them like he's then probably he's good free. to go yeah Why? truly <laughs> wild absolutely wild but i am glad that irene garza's family finally had an arrest 
you know, in that case because, man, they, they went through so much. Yeah. So Mandy, let's move on to last thing before we go. As we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we are going to be doing a moment on February 12th and we'd love for you all to join. Um, we'll have information in the show notes, but I thought Mandy, since we're not nervous at all, but we could go through some like fails. What could happen during our live show <laughs> if we if we messed up? Maybe these are different like the the process that we could go through. So I'd like you to open that first video. Uh, and what will it mean for uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children's just walked in. I mean, shift it, shifting shifting sands in the region. Do you think relations with the north may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the, um, pardon me. Oh, I've seen this one. <laughs> I've seen this one. It's one of my absolute favorites. Total classic. The guy on live TV, his daughter in the yellow just comes bouncing in. The baby, <laughs> you know, that runs through. It's just so funny. Like when I the see first, the mom like, like running into the room. Yeah, like, she's like <laughs> freaking out, pulling them. Such classic stuff. But I refer to this one as denial because he's truly not checked into what's going on. He's denying what's happening behind him. So that's one option. If we make a mistake during our live show, we have the option of denial, right? Absolutely. I feel like we're so, good at that one. <laughs> perfect. And the next one, uh, go ahead and watch the next one. Um, and I will tell you what that one is after you're done. Well, because you guys are dragging me down. You guys keep... Oh. Well, every time I get done with the seven day, you guys are like... Oh, gosh. Oh. Okay. Okay, so Mandy, what what were you just watching? I was watching some I was watching a meteorologist have a little moment. He was about, having a moment. He was having a moment. Hey, there you go. I didn't even mean to. Oh, there you go. <laughs> he was Look having a moment just it. like we are going to have a moment. Uh, I would refer to that one as <laughs> anger, right? That's yes. his, that's the second stage of, you know, grief. This is his anger moment. Okay, the third one is Titus at the bottom. Moron, you're on the air. No, 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 no. Ah! Oh, Carol. Oh, no. Why? I want to start over. I want to be a baby. Can you hear me now, Mr. Andromedon? So, yeah, so Titus being unprepared, being not ready for camera to go live. And yes. saying and he's bargaining that are embarrassing. Right? <laughs> he's bargaining and saying, I wish I... I wish I could go back to be a baby, that sort of thing. Yes. <laughs> so in our live show, we could bargain if we need to. But ultimately, Mandy, it's going to come down to acceptance. Whatever we screw up in our live show, this is really where we have to take it to. So roll the last one. Does snow in Winter Park. Look at this beautiful shot this afternoon. You can, wow! Yeah, y'all! Yeah, 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 um, yeah, it's, it's, so it's going to be kind of cold today. Temps in the thirties. By tonight, we should see some clearing skies. All right. You have a good one. Okay. Cause I don't really understand what happened here, huh? The, the, there was some kind of an issue. And so instead of, instead of panicking, she breaks out into a little jig. A jig. And then she eventually crawls off the stage. <laughs> I, have, I didn't get to that part okay. where she crawled off the stage. Um, but that is actually where I probably will start. That will be my <laughs> my first <laughs> my first reaction. That is acceptance. So basically what we're saying is for this live show, we're going to have a really good time. I hope everyone enjoys it. Mandy, we can we can get angry, we can bargain. We can, you know, do all of these things, but ultimately it's going to be Fight acceptance. or flight. So, <laughs> yeah, if you want the chance of seeing Mandy or I crawl off stage, then Check out our moment on February 12th, and we'll have the information in our show notes. <laughs> Perfect. All right, guys, that is it for this week. We will be back next week. Same time, same place, new story. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.